one more shot and uh, see what happens hopefully this doesn't freeze this time I don't know sometimes I just think the universe is like you're not doing that today boo you know like you're not gonna stream today like your spirit guides have other plans for you today okay no <laughs> so whoa hopefully we're good I'm sure everybody will let us know I can't like the stream is kind of frozen on my side I can't see how many viewers are in like I have no idea what's going on um, I'm like, should we go back to restream? I don't know. What, like, why do you pay for these programs and they don't work? It's just crazy. Especially when one little thing throws it off. Right, right. Especially one little thing throws it off. And, um, microphone-wise, doing audio check, you're a little far from the mic. So if you could just talk, yeah, a little, talk a little closer to the mic, you know. All right. Well, that was exhausting. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Woo! All right. Eventually, we'll get this right. Eventually, this will be perfect. It will. You know, one thing at a time. So, um, La Llorona, I'm going to let you kind of... Have, were, were you into La Llorona? I'm going to have you just chat for a sec to make sure your audio sounds okay on that side, and then Kat can let us know. Have you ever investigated anywhere where there's a screaming banshee? Unfortunately, I have not had that chance to, um, as far as I know. I've read plenty of legends and stories of, of screaming like the wailing woman essentially mm -hmm. like the legend of the wailing woman not necessarily La, La Llorona herself but variations and it, it is similar where it's either nearby a bridge or a body of water it seems mm -hmm. that, that she's often heard yeah it's one of those legends where uh, I think this is more on the Mexican side Hispanic side of culture where um, she drowned her children and she's screaming because she drowned her children and can't find either the bodies or the souls of her children and, and there's essentially like a story behind it where god or like the being won't allow her back in until she like brings her children with her for the torment that she sort of put them through by drowning them i investigated this little teeny hole in the wall location um back in like i think it was like 2015 2013 somewhere in there and it was called um, Antonito, Colorado. It's literally like the very southernmost point of Colorado. You have to, like the next like largest city is called Alamosa and it's like literally two hours outside of Al Alamosa. So it's out in the middle of nowhere, Colorado. And oh. it's really haunted. There's only like 800 people for like capacity of like who lives there. But really there's only like 200 people alive still, you know? So like that's not even like that census isn't accurate, you know? It's like practically a ghost town. It is. And it's the kind of ghost town that you really don't want to get, like, find yourself in. Because it, since it's so far out in the middle of nowhere, they kind of, like, are their own government. You know what I mean? Like, that kind of place. Oh, and, I got you. And there's, Very like, wild. criminal things and, like, drug lords and that, you know, like, that kind of thing going on there. And, like, the police are in on it you know what i mean like the police are sketched too and like they they're a part of the drug ring so it's, it's a very strange city and what is this second story you told me of investigation like 
and it is this town in the middle of nowhere. Like, you don't want to be walking at night, but we got to go check out these ghosts. It's so dangerous here, but we got to go check out these It's things. Well, it's weird because, like, all, t- all those small towns are different because I've been to the Bross Hotel. So the Bross Hotel was – that was a different small town feeling. That was the one where they had, like, the weird satanic cult, like, doing satanic stuff at, like, 4 in the morning. It was really strange. You, we like my entire crew woke up at like three four in the morning to a satanic chant chanting going on and it was rhythmic <laughs> and it was definitely like latin or like a different language you know and so that was even weirder that was different and like we went and filmed b-roll in the town where bross is where's bross paonia colorado it's also like in the middle of nowhere and when you're in the middle of paonia colorado they do not like outsiders i mean antonito didn't like outsiders either but, like, you walk in wearing all black, like, the witchy vibe, like, gothic vibe, and they're, like, ooh, they're from, like, the modern world. It, like, literally feels like you stepped through a portal. You know what I mean? Have you ever been somewhere like that, Elfie? Like, you've got to know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I've been to, like, I don't think I've quite gotten to that level, but I've been to places where it's, like, small town, middle of nowhere, countryside, where it's one of those, like, everyone knows everyone, so they will know you're from out of town, and if if you look remotely fringe or like dressed slightly out there, you will stick out with like a sore, sore thumb and most likely they're not there. Like, yeah, no, you're not from around here. Right. And then they're like, where are you from? And like, yeah, when we went and filmed in, um, Paonia, this is a good topic to tie into this. Cause honestly, like all that weird, like local lore goes with all of this. But when we were in Paonia, that one is kind of like, I mean, if you know, like, anywhere in Colorado, it's sort of, like, near Aspen, but it's, like, it's off to the side of Aspen. Like, Aspen's the closest, which is the total opposite, right? Because Aspen's, like, money and celebrities and, like, you know, like, big million-dollar houses. And then you have Paonia that's, like, culty, you know? Like, there's cults there and like really creepy stuff but like it's more farming and then you have Antonito where it's more of like a drug run town and the thing with Antonito that was strange was so we get there and the innkeeper of this location was like just make sure like you bring all of your film equipment and don't leave anything valuable in the car because there's a chance that your car will get broken into overnight oh geez it sounds almost like you turn around and suddenly your car's on cinder blocks and and I was like, oh, that's great. Like, I feel really safe. She's like, well, one of two things will happen. Either they'll break in your car or they'll be too scared to do it because they know, like, you're from the outside and, like, they don't want you reporting what goes on here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And luckily, yeah. no, nobody messed with the vehicle, thank God. Um, but, yeah, it was really strange. And so we ended up – we talked with the innkeeper who – the location was, like, very haunted. It's um, That was called the River's Inn, and it was, like, really old mansion. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, haunted, like, lots of deaths surrounding the whole area. A lot of mysterious deaths in the area. But um, in that same pilot that's online, um, the innkeeper was like, you need to go talk to the woman that runs the train station. So I ran down there and did an interview with her really quick, which is on that pilot, and – She's like, oh, yeah, no, ghosts aren't the only thing we have here. We have Bigfoot. We have Hellhounds. We have a UFO watchtower that was put here by the U.S. military. Oh, and if you go down the road just a little ways to the waterway, that's where the La Llorona lives. And I was like, cool. What else do you have here? Like, you have literally everything in one place. You know what I mean? So it does make you wonder if those locations have, like, portals. Well, it, it sounds almost like, too, it's like you're you're in a place that, like, civilization has is not really encroaching on nature, so you have all the crypto stuff, and you have all the strange folklore stuff, and it's just like, since not a lot of people, I guess, there mess around, and they just have weird stuff that kind of, like, zooms in on it, too, because you have the mountains and everything where, like, the UFO things happen, so it's like, oh, cool, and by the way, Love your own is down the river here, too. I know. Well, and I said, wait a second, the backup. The military <laughs> installed a UFO tower. Like, literally, you know what I mean? And she was like, oh, yeah, the military installed the UFO tower. And uh, we get, like, mutilated cattle here all the time. And she was so, like, casual. And I was like, that's not normal. 
Wait, did she say if it was a still an active tower? Or oh, like yeah. Just... Oh, it's active, yeah. Like, she's like, oh, we spot UFOs here all the time, and, like, there's, there's cattle mutilations, and I'm just like, should I be staying here with my crew? Like, <laughs> should I be here right now? Typical weekend. <laughs> We're going to either get abducted or get taken by an alien. Uh, maybe La Llorona is going to drown us in the river. Like, there's all these things. So, yeah, I mean, actually... I think that a lot of these these lore that we talk about, which is like the screaming banshee thing, I think it exists more than we know because we we had done research obviously on Rivers End before we went to Antonito, and none of the research research before we arrived talked about La Llorona. So mm. it's interesting. Like I think it's it's more prominent than people know. And she's like, oh yeah. I was like, well, how do you know it's a screaming banshee? You know, like how do you know it's a it's it's what they say it is it's it's um she drowned her ch children and she's like oh well you know us locals will go down to the river all the time and you'll just hear her start screaming at you and like there's nobody there but we and we've caught it on camera they showed me a couple of clips that they'd caught and it was like that blood curdling high pitched like scream and like, i was like not like an animal freaking out or anything well i mean and there's nothing around but it was like plains you know what i mean not like not mountains it was like flat plains so you'd be oh, able to I see anything know. that's there you yeah. know what i mean well yeah if it's that loud it should it sounds like it should be like pretty close but you're not seeing it well and it supposedly she had said that you know and it was obviously an older story of like the 1800s mm -hmm. that somebody went down to explore it and they drowned and they mm -hmm. said that this person was alone, and so ever since then, don't go alone to the river, or an don't antagonize La Llorona, or she'll drown you. That's probably good. Good note to have. <laughs> That's probably a good idea to follow. You yeah, know what I mean? Um, so oh, this goes in. I like which side of it? Do you like the Mexican lore side or the Irish side better? Well, what I found interesting was with like. Um, I'm more familiar with the, the Irish lore banshee and also just how it, like, even reading over the notes and everything, how it has changed and evolved and, um, be, it, like, this image of something that is looked at as kind of a spirit or a fae, it kind of flips back and forth and has kind of evolved over time depending on going from oral lore to, to like written lore and everything mm -hmm. which is interesting because i'm more familiar with the mexican side or the hispanic side and that's because growing up in colorado mm -hmm. they say you know we're above like new mexico and new mexico i've be been there many times to investigate as well and they all feel like it's very connected from like the hispanic side um like la, la brujeria type of thing like what what cat practices which is also really really interesting so it's kind of cool to see this side. Yeah, I didn't realize that the fairy side was connected to it, which I love fairy lore. I respect fairy lore. Um, do you believe in, like, that lower level stuff? And when I say lower level, fairies are considered lower level, but they're not considered demonic, so let's get that straight. They're just considered, mm -hmm. like, a lower level vibration of, like, where our, like, parallel universe is planed. So, like, do you think those things exist? Like, what would be considered fairies is the actual fairies, trolls, gnomes, um, you know, anything of that. Have you ever experienced any of that while you were investigating? Well, not while I was investigating, but I have um, worked, tried to work with, like, the local, like, the um, land spirits or local fae of the area and everything, like, kind of giving offerings and whatnot, and... This is what I find interesting is oftentimes it feels like uh, some stores kind of took uh, spirits, deities, any, anything unusual and outside of the mainstream of that time and kind of lumped it into fae because mm -hmm. they're like, this thing is supernatural, so it must be a fae. Mm -hmm. And it seems like later on as... Um, Folklorists and researchers have tried to kind of pick it away and try to find the actual, like, what is this? Is this actually a fae or is this a land spirit or actually an old god? Because a lot of times, especially with the Irish folklore, a lot of these might have been ancient deities mm -hmm. of the land that just either would become demonized or reduced to a just a, um, a fairy or a spirit. Mm -hmm. 
because they couldn't entirely get rid of it because of it, how ingrained it was in, in the area. So I respect it. I've had friends that really are into, like, the bay thing, and they, like, it is, it's a, it's about, I mean, I, I guess if you're, like, incorporating, like, witchcraft or spell work with it, it would be very much connected to, like, green witch work or, like, being an earth witch type of thing. And you can give thanks to them or that or summon them in for protection for your house. But the problem is, is that you have to give them offerings. So there's there's ways of doing that. You can plant flowers, take care of the flowers. You can, um, cat, can you take care of that person uh, on the mod and get rid of them? Um, you can um, offer them coins. You can put po coins in the ground. You can um, do, you know, you know, you can give offerings to all of these different kind of things. And I always get scared because I get busy with my schedule, and they say that sort of if you don't, um, like, give the offerings to the Fae after you've summoned them in or brought them in, that's when they can get mad or they become trick tricksters and, like, turn on you. You've heard that kind of lore, right, Elfie? Yeah. Um, one of the things, like, I know I've done for, for myself is usually um, one of the things you can do is, like, if you have a backyard... Um, you can leave a area of it for just kind of like a wild, like wildflower stuff. Like basically, not not interfere with that part of nature. You, like you said, you can plant flowers and such. And basically, the idea of caring for the earth and showing respect for it. Now, there's obviously there's hundreds of different kinds of fay, and what I normally do is I'll offer the the normal like milk and honey and bread and such and do this more on like a holiday seasonal basis mm -hmm. um, to show respect and everything. And one of the, the things that sometimes uh, some lords talk about is you want to give offerings, but you don't necessarily want to say this is a gift or something like that. But you, it's like you give out food, but you don't tell them that, hey, I'm giving you food or something like that. Um, and then what I find interesting is a lot of times in the stories, you have people who weren't even like practitioners or anything like that, but they just they knew about the brownies and they knew about the fae that worked around and they worked with them, unless somehow they they assaulted them, which is entirely possible because their idea of etiquette is sometimes different than ours and can sometimes easily like insult them, but it like takes it quite a bit. And it's that, why does that scare me though? <laughs> why does that scare me? I think it's because we hear so many stories of the idea of, like, the Fae, like, taking people away, and honestly, half the time it's usually more, like, trickster, almost poltergeist activity, and you just, like, you put something out to hopefully appease them, and then they stop, and or they just go away because they're like, well, we don't want to be around you, and just leave, unless you do the bad thing where some stories have talked about people destroying fairy mounds and stuff, which is just, if you really want to peeve them off, do that. Right. So I have experienced Faye before mm. at the Stanley Hotel. Oh, cool. Yeah, so the Stanley Hotel oh, sits on top of um, tons of, like, bedrock, and that includes, mm -hmm. like, quartz. So, I mean, as if it's not just bad enough haunted as it is, now you have a plethora of electromagnetic fields sitting underneath it just waiting to become a magnet for anything. Mm-hmm. And so there's different buildings, obviously. You have, like, the main Stanley Hotel. You have the concert hall. You have the manor house. Um, it, there's a ton, There's the presidential suite. Like, there's tons of different locations, obviously, like, on the property. So it's interesting because, you know, it's all on the bedrock of, like, courts. In fact, if you go, there's private tunnels. They used to give tours through the private tunnels, which is where the staff locates. Like, if you're going to lunch, like, let's say you're, get, you're off work from being a housekeeper, you have to go underground through the private tunnels. And when they used to give tours, I don't know if they do anymore, you can go walk through those tunnels and you actually can see the courts. Like, you can see, it's like, it literally, it's not a joke. Like, it exists. But, um, you know, unfortunately, in all of the locations, sometimes you're going to get the wrong people involved that are coming to stay at the Stanley Hotel. And then they're going to start summoning things and they're going to practice Wicca, black magic, Bay magic. So uh, people started coming in and summoning things in the Stanley Hotel because it's so powerful. So you have like the typical, atypical energies that are already there. You have energies that I think just come in via passing. There's probably portals, but now you have people that have summoned things in. 
So there was this one time I was investigating at the concert hall of the Stanley Hotel, and I've talked about it before, but um, I, my friend Callie at the time was the paranormal investigator. Re, uh, what did they call her? Residential paranormal investigator. Mm-hmm. She actually got paid to just, like, be the invest. Can you imagine? What a job. Awesome. Yeah, like, what a job. So she was always have, doing events, and obviously I had had my time with Paranormal Challenge, and I went up to see her constantly because she had this, you know, free access to the whole hotel all the time. Mm-hmm. And we were investigating the concert hall one night, and uh, a troll uh, manifested. And of course, it's dark, so it's already dark, but you, now you're seeing the outline of this thing, you know? And it really kind of messes with your brain, because in yeah. a way, we have been trained to not believe in that stuff. Like, we've been taught that that's like fairy tales and like children's books, you know what I mean? So when you see, like, a 3D image that has just, and, and like, short, but I guess, tr- you know, like, you have gnomes and trolls. Those are very different. Trolls are, like, you know, really realistically sort of, like, you remember the treasure trolls that they had, like, the spiky hair? and so. But it was about four feet tall, I would say, so it was shorter. But it was, like, the stocky troll, and you could tell, I mean, it was a troll. And it didn't look angry. It didn't really have any emotion. It was just yeah. sort of there. But, like, I remember... It was an energy since you're so not used to like being around. We're tip, you know, typically you're going to investigate and, and interact with other human energies, which is familiar for us. And I just remember being around that energy, and I literally like threw my all of us did we threw ourselves against the wall so hard yeah. because we didn't want any like we didn't want anything between us and the wall. You know what I mean? Like there, we didn't want any space. And it's it is it's strange because when you finally experience it. You're just kind of like, wow, like, this stuff does exist. Like, this is legit. Like, personally, that would be honestly fascinating. And it kind of makes sense with the Stanley because it's it's right by the mountain. That you have the caves and the the stone earthy stuff. I can see the possibility of a troll or troll-like being hanging out there. And it, it does sound like it was just chilling and doing what it is. Well, every yeah. building's different, and I wonder why. I wonder if it's because people have summoned things in each building. But, like, on the same subject of Faye, there's the presidential suite, too. Mm. And the presidential suite um, has a leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know you laugh because, like, once again, you have been trained not to believe this stuff. You know what I mean? I, I- See, my, my brain goes to, like, horror movie Leprechaun, but I, I've also read about, like, the actual folklore of the Leprechaun and everything, so it's mm-hmm. one of those, either one doesn't sound like something you really want to encounter necessarily either. It was kind of a mesh of both. Like, I don't think those energies, when they're here, I don't think they necessarily, like, uh, want to kill you. You know what I mean? Like, no. I don't think it was the horror movie kind, but they're definitely tricksters. I was there at an event with Ghost Adventures, and it was Aaron, Billy, and Dave Schrader staying in the presidential suite. And I had been there for an after party. And um, Billy and I had had a few drinks, I'm not going to lie. And we kept seeing it. Like, we, and we were like, are we drunk? Like, literally, like, have I had, like, I've only had a couple of drinks. Like, what's wrong with me, you know? And, like, yeah. we thought we were making it up. And then all of a sudden, you would see it run. And it was little. I would say, like, a foot or less. And it, would, it was slamming doors throughout the presidential suite. It was just, it, it wanted to mess with everybody. You know what I mean? And oh, Billy yeah. was like, dude, I don't even know how I'm going to sleep here tonight. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, so it is well, weird. Those, Go ahead. Yeah, those things, actually, those encounters fascinate me more because of the idea of, like, not just you read the folklore, but then you encounter something that, because everyone talks about, like, negative energies or, or strange energies, but then when you literally see something that does not register as a person like it's obviously not a person it's something else your brain kind of like tries to rationalize like what am i looking at but you're like nope that is definitely not you well and when and especially like because the stanley for me like i had been there so many times you know what i mean so it was just like home it was like a second home comfortable for me i had investigated so many times but it's weird because like when you do finally experience those things 
-hmm. it just changes your perspective on things you're like anything could exist like i've seen some crazy stuff and anything could literally exist and i wish you know i'm not the kind of like i don't know how you feel i'd love to hear your take on this I'm, I mean, I like to be skeptical, too. Like, I don't take everyone's word for it. You know what I mean? Like, I want to experience it. Like, I know you have your evidence, but I want to experience it myself. Like, I want to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, I'm not the kind of investigator that is, like, pushes people to, like, don't be a skeptic. Like, I don't really care if people are skeptics. Because if they would have experienced the things I've experienced... They wouldn't be a skeptic, you know what I mean? Like, what's your what's your take on it? I know you you are on the more skeptical side of things. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely more on the the skeptical side of things. When just because, um, I think it's for me. It's like I need to also like experience it personally to really believe it. And I've definitely had my strange experiences that even to this day sometimes I look at it and like try to reanalyze did I actually experience something or not and there's been something I'm like no that was just strange I don't know what it was but it was just and I think it's partially for me that I I feel like I need to be slightly skeptical just to ask questions because I always say I believe in the possibility of everything but it doesn't mean I will believe everything someone tells me they've experienced I'll, I'll will like hear them but if they want do they want my personal thoughts or do they want to just tell me their experience? Mm-hmm. Another thing too, though, I like to um, personally interpret things on my own. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you feel about that. I like, like to, yeah. like, oh, what, sure. like, oh, for example, you and I make fun of it all the time. We're, we're talking crap about, um, I love Zach and his show. Obviously, he's successful. You know what I mean? But, uh-huh. like, you know, it's not always demons. Like, but that's his gig. That's his show. That's his series. That's he, he presents things on the dark side. He has to show the side of paranormal that's the dark side. Like, that's what he's supposed to do. You know, like, that's his job. But Elfie and I will be on the phone talking and chatting, and we're like, but it's not a demon. You know, like, I want to be there and experience it myself. And, like, really, nine times out of ten, you're more than likely just to run into a regular dead person that literally doesn't know they're dead. Yeah. You're you're more likely to run into a a grumpy dead person or, honestly, just a collection of energy that didn't get cleared out than a demon. And it's like, yeah, that's his shtick, but it's, it's not... It's not all demons. No, it's true. Well, and, like, wh- what's your, like, opinion on, like, the likelihood of, like, running into demonic activity? I think it's much, I mean, <laughs> I think it's much lower than people. Th- I, I, unfortunately, and there, I think there's a difference between people, there's a difference between running into something you're not sure what it is because if you have experience with something pinching you or pushing you or scratching you, something people's like, oh my God, it's a demon. And we have to think like, maybe that's something that's trying to communicate with you and that's the only way they know how because there's only so much energy they can exert. Not everything acting out means it's demonic. I but agree like 4,000%. <laughs> but because we think, oh my God, it did something to me. It must be a demon. It's like, no, it's not a demon not <laughs> mm-hmm. no it's i not, agree like, and that's not that's the narrative that we want to change because it's not always dark but like i will tell you this i've been doing interviews all week to bring on a new crew you know like we've been doing interviews cat and i all week and it's a nightmare i'm just be honest like it's so not fun and you know like one of the questions i always ask people is can you be alone in an asylum by yourself because you know it's part of the job description as a ghost hunter you know I don't even have to ask Elfie that. Like, I know she's fine, you know? Yeah, like she, like she's, like, excited, you know? Um, yeah, well, and me, too. Like, if, if we're in a big location, we have to split up. There's nothing we can do about it. We have to get footage, you know what I mean? But these people are like, oh, no, I, I've watched Ghost Adventures, and I think it's mean what Zach does to Aaron, and he makes him go in alone. And I'm scared if I go into asylum, I'm going to run into a demon. And I'm like, that's what the media's done to people. That is what Hollywood's done to people, is they are training investigators that, like Elfie said, if you get scratched or hurt, is it is it demonic? 
I'd say like 80 to 90 percent it's not demonic is my opinion I and, mean, and it's more it's more shocking to me when someone has a actual physical interaction with something than than anything else because like I feel like that probably takes a great exertion of energy for anything to poke you scratch you bite you I mean and it's like I don't think I no. <laughs> and that's per Jack said if a person was a butthole in life, they could be a butthole in death, one hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Well and once again, if you're in their house and like they think they've been owning that house, they're stuck in a time warp of when they died, like in the nineteen sixties. Mm-hmm. Like they, why they're thinking, Why are you in my space? Why why the hell are you here? Like you and then they then you get a ghost hunters that are like demanding answers. And then the oh, ghost yeah. is like, You're in my house demanding answers from me. What would you do if it was your house? I would scratch the shit out of somebody, too. I'd be like, who the hell do you think you are in my house telling me what I should be doing? And I just don't think people realize that's, like, the real side of it. That's the real side of it. Oh, yeah. I think half the time we're encountering these grumpy people who are like, what are you doing here and why are you asking me for the 10,000th time how I died? Yeah, yeah, you're right. The repetitive answers, rather than including them in in the conversation. But another side is, too, and I want to get your opinion on this. When you run into demonic energy, do you know it's demonic? You do. Like, that energy is, you cannot, you cannot forget that energy. Even if they're trying to come through as, like, something friendly, I can tell when it's bad. When, yeah, when you encounter something, like, I think it's more of a rare thing, but when you encounter something that legit has not good intentions for someone, you're, you're, uh, the, the little... The red flag in the back of your head goes off of like something's not right here. Like there's a difference I think between n- um, not sure what's going on or being hesitant and the automatic automatic need to want to run mm-hmm. instead of. <laughs> no, I agree. I completely agree with that. Um, so it's just and then you know you have the La Llorona, which I think people and why hasn't it been investigated more? Do you think people are afraid of it? Um. I, I think it's just, it's, well, I mean, there's so many places that claim that have the La Llorona uh, spirit, like, almost, like, it sounds like almost, like, every creek had its own little version of La Llorona, so I don't know if it's just more difficult to pinpoint it. Um, I could see the hesitancy just because there's so many versions of how she interacts with people, like, sometimes it's just hearing her wails and her cries and everything, other times it's the people claim they see her actually walking along the river creek and everything and some stories seem to evolve her into like almost like a boogeyman like unfortunately now pop culture has turned her more into a boogeyman of be careful she might steal your children Mm -hmm. if you anchor her and counter her which the earlier stories don't seem to be like that well she's also been kind of interpreted now into like a witch where she can like harm you with black magic Mm mhm and that wasn't how it really was in the beginning. And I'm like, so it just makes you wonder if it's it's the society creating lore of fear around it. And it makes you wonder if you just went down there to, t- to communicate with her like a normal person mm-hmm. and be like, I'm so sorry that you've passed and like do the communication rather than just get scared of the screams. Would you be helping what? that energy rather than just leaving it and running away from it like everyone else? Yeah, and honestly, listening to the stories, like, I honestly, I feel so sad for her because you have the stories of her, either she drowns her children, drowns her children out of anger because her husband has decided to marry someone else, or she, it, something happens and her children are killed by her hands, and the next moment she realizes what she happens, and she either walks around wasting away, or she kills herself. And it just sounds so sad of this this no-win situation that it's like, oh, my God, how can we help you? Well, in verbatim, it's exactly, exactly. How can we help you? This is sad. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, I believe in curses, but I also don't believe something can hurt you unless it's harmed you first. That's very much like a Wiccan way of thinking, a witchcraft way of thinking. Um, but literally verbatim, Kat found this, says she killed herself on her way to heaven God stopped her and said he would not let her in until she found her children because she drowned them in the river. Her children, however, were already in heaven, so she was sentenced to search for them indefinitely for eternity. 
as punishment for her cruel actions. Yeah. It's and sad. I, I that is sad. I think that is more of a, a reworking of the original story that and it maybe this interpretation because society think looks at it that a mother should be nurturing and giving everything to their children. So the idea of a mother for whatever reason taking their life is society looks at that it should be eternal punishment. Right. When it's like you could look at why it happened, which is oftentimes because someone angered her, her husband betrayed her, her lover betrayed her. Betrayal starts it all. <laughs> so that's an interesting interpretation, and I agree with that. So you're saying, you know, essentially God sends her back, says you can't come cross over to heaven. But now mm -hmm. she's like down here screaming, crying, looking for her children. They're not here, obviously. And then now society has also shunned her. And now she's left there without any help, without anyone to communicate with her. Just because they're in fear of the screams and now in fear of the lore. And, you know, I love lore. I love all lore because I, I mean, I, I really believe I had a past life with Atlantis. I'm very connected with Atlantis and even Lumeria and all the crystals that are associated with it and whatnot. But I do wonder if you put a woman's touch on, like, an investigation of La Llorona, how that could change people's outer interpretations of it mm -hmm. rather than like us going and and once again it's because the paranormal industry has been so lopsided with 95 percent men you haven't had a female's empathetic touch on these stories so far the only side we have seen god love him is zach's masculine I'm a tough guy with greasy hair and biceps, and I'm going to take a demon down with my shoulder. I'm going to do a shoulder check. You know what I mean? So you haven't had the feminist touch of, like, oh, my God, let me help you. Like, how can I help you? Like, and I'm not saying we cross people over. That's a whole other gig we don't do, and I don't ever claim to do that. But, like, how can we listen to your story? You know, and it's sort of like when we did the pilot. In the pilot, we talk about this, and... Um, I thought we were going to end up connecting with Native American spirits, and we ended up connecting with miners that had died. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> Kat and I are in bed. Like we, we, you know, the location we were staying at was very small, so Kat and I shared a bedroom, and you could hear the bed shaking like every 15 minutes. And we were taking turns sleeping for like 30 minute intervals, and it, it like the energy. The only way I can describe it is it felt like every there was like 30 people came in the room to see what we were about. And then one of us would recite the St. Michael prayer while the other one slept. And then it felt like the energies were gone. So it was almost like they were waiting for us to, like, help them see the light or their spirit guides or whatever. Because we, all we were doing was trying to sleep. You know what I mean? Like, I just wanted to get some sleep. And so, but once again, that's putting that feminism touch of, like, rather being in fear. Oh, my God. This is so sad. How can I help you? Yeah. Oh, it's it's trying to um, have a better understanding because like the the stories talk about how I don't know she she gets villainized almost mm -hmm. and because of the, the what she does to the children and everything but they almost forget like why it happened and it's not to just like the reasons for the actions but to empathize with her and understand where she was coming from with it and I know a lot of it was a, is a cautionary tale of not to... Um, well, it's true. What if she had a miscarriage? What mm -hmm. if... I'm just saying. What if she had a stillbirth? What if she... Well, what if it wasn't even a drowning and, like, the interpretation's been twisted? What if well, yeah, she um, had postpartum depression and killed herself? You know, like, literally, like, like, you, like you have to dig this apart on a human mm -hmm. level not on a fear level and assume she's just a demon well yeah i mean you even talked about sort of where she she does the act and then like moments later she like almost comes out of whatever moment of anger and she realizes what have i done mm -hmm. and tries to save them or tries to, to pull them out of the water and it's too late and everything and she's like she just like is immediately regretful of what happened mm -hmm. Well, and mental health. Who knows what kind of mental health state she was in? 
what if it was a mental health crisis? I mean, it well, kind I mean, of t- the- it ties into the female asylums of like not all women went there just because they had mental issues. Like mm-hmm. like we talked about last week, you could literally have your period and complain about period pain and you were stuck in the asylum. You could fart wrong around your husband and he throws you in the asylum. You know what I mean? Like it's so messed up. It isn't it messed yeah, up? Well, there was a long list of these hysterics, and you look at them now, it's like, wait, these were, like, considered legit reasons, and now most of these are looked at as these are outpatient or manageable um, illnesses that people can work through. In fact, back then, they're like, oh my goodness, we don't know what to do with you, we don't want to deal with it, we're just going to put you over here. Oh, you're LGBTQ? We have to put you through a lobotomy first. What? That's a little extreme. Jesus, take the wheel! My God, that that's that's a little extreme here. You know, like it's just insane to me. It's just insane, and that's what I love about us being able to step in as females and and change the narrative because it's wrong. It's been wrong. Well, it's it's trying to rehumanize the stories because they're I what I enjoy with folklore and these legends is that. A lot of it is uh, evolution of oral tales, and and you have various cultures attaching their stories onto it. And but there's always some sort of kernel of truth. There's there's it started somewhere. Mm-hmm. There was some origin of it, and it's trying to dig in, trying to find where that origin was and why it started, and then grew from there. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's getting you're right. Rehumanizing it 100 percent. And, and even, especially with the women's and his women one, and I'm really proud of all the streams we've done this month. It's also just, you know, taking your power back as a female, because I really do feel like, including La Llorona, you know, for a long time, why are these locations so haunted? Because women were treated like property. They weren't treated mm-hmm. like humans. We were not humanized. And why? Makes no sense. You know, it's just, it's crazy. And people were literally tortured because of it. And that could even include La Llorona. I mean, what if it was, like I said, mental health, a miscarriage, something like that. So it is, it's kind of reinterpreting these stories and these folklore into something that seems like it could be a very realistic situation. Hmm. Rather than oh, I, slapping it with a tag that says demon on it. I do like in the chat, it, um, they mention offering, do- offering her dolls or carvings of children as something to help her connect empathy with kids mm-hmm. or turn her kids basically through kind of like a image of a child to her mm-hmm. I if agree. that would help well it is it's like it's you're respecting the energy and like i personally don't think energies have been respected mm-hmm. i've talked about that and, and not not just women's locations in all locations i think you know unfortunately i think there's a rat race with Um, so many paranormal shows out there. I think it's become extremely saturated with with male investigators. And really, the only result they're seeking is the best evidence. And the only way they think they can get the best evidence is by provoking or doing something to piss the energy off or, or like I talked about, taking a noose to a plantation. And it's just not... It's like you're dehumanizing the energies, and it's like... I don't know. I, I have so much empathy for all beings, like all creatures. Like my Native American side is like I respect literally plants. You know what I mean? Like I give respect to everything we walk on with my Native side. And it just it's crazy to me that I think we need to reel it back in here. Well, I think the problem is, is with a lot of these shows is I understand with investigations, a lot of times you could be sitting around for hours with very little activity happening. And if you put a camera on that, that could get boring real fast. So there has to be some sort of visual um, showing of the story and of the investigation. And it unfortunately sometimes seems to be like it's very overblown or sensationalized. So it's trying to find a new way to show that empathy visually to still keep the, te- the audience's attention while still respectfully telling the, the story of the location of the and I think that's the trick there with it. Right. I agree. I agree 100%. And it's kind of letting the location and the energy speak for themselves. Like, let them tell the stories. 
Oh yeah, like the real, the actual stories, the reality is stranger than fiction at the time. Like if you dig into the history, you'll find some strange stuff. You don't need to make up anything or overblown it. You just read for and it's strange. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree, and you know, like the one locations that makes me the most upset is some of the groups that have gone to um, asylums for veterans. And I just think it's it hasn't been done right. It hasn't been done well, and it's not fair to sort of make a mockery out of these veterans that have served our country mm -hmm. and try to say there's a demon in here, like, abusing all the other veterans. we got to find the demon and pull it out of here. It's just, And, like, how, how did y'all get a show before me? How did y'all get signed before I did? <laughs> Jesus, you know, it's just... It's it's crazy that, like, what they allow, and I guess that's just the Hollywood side of it. But you're right. You go to these locations, and there's already energy and EMFs, and, and you're connecting. You don't need to fake it. You don't need to make it dramatic. You don't need to disrespect the land energy or the entities because they're already there ready to communicate. It's almost like, but you're not listening. Mm -hmm. You're making time. your own narrative, and you're not listening, you know? Yeah, and I don't think it's not even a matter of, like, I I don't mind, like, when I see some of them when they do re reenactments, like, when they're telling the story and you see the reenactment, though sometimes they do get a little cheesy with the reenactments, they go a little overboard with it, so I don't know if it's just the idea that it has to be big and flashy in space, it's like, it doesn't have to be like that to mm -hmm. still be entertaining, mm -hmm. while still also be, being informative, and I think that's where the balance is needs to be reset almost well i also think that just you know with my experience with chanel and cat like being on set like it just does make you wonder if women have a little bit more of sensitivity of, of being in tune with the other side because we did capture some good evidence like we got some good stuff while we were there and i just so i'm excited for the future i'm very excited for the future i think some of it is also probably patience because it takes time i think with investigation it does take time unless you have something a place that's really just popping right from the get-go you have to have patience and let it come to you almost and maybe that doesn't happen enough like you go in and you investigate for a few hours and it's like why isn't something happening like right now it's like that's not how it works mm -hmm. You have to give it time. <laughs> I agree. And we need to have a little more patience. <laughs> right, I agree. Except when we were at our last location, man, it just, like, we weren't ready, and it was unfolding, and we were like, get the cameras, oh, my God. You know, like, we're not ready. See, that's a rare right there. That's yes. a rare moment. There. And, oh, man. I mean, I don't know. I've had some pretty good investigations. Maybe it's locations that I pick, you know? But, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I think people's houses are a little bit different when you're doing, like, a personal location. Um, yeah. because the energies are really attached to the people and then it, like for safety purposes obviously you ask the family to like leave for the evening or whatever I always feel really guilty uh, doing personal locations because I'm always like do you want me to sage afterwards because like you know investigating can be kind of dangerous in your own house so yeah. I, I feel a very big sense of responsibility when it's like a personal location like that rather than like a big location where they're just sort of used to it but then even on yeah. the flip side, you look at somewhere like, um, what's it called? Lizzie Borden, and I think it's just been killed and overdone. Oh, there's too many people going through there. Well, I well, mean, I think, I think they're disrespecting the energies, and I think, you know, there was a psychic that accused the dad of molesting her or whatever, and that wasn't something that they captured on evidence. It was all through the psychic, and, like, I'm not saying the psychic's discredited, but I just yeah. think that you shouldn't be accusing an energy unless they're here to represent themselves of something like that. Like, that's some serious... Th She's like, oh, like, I'm a psychic. Like, I just was in tune to it. But it seemed like after that, every all the energy in the Lizzie Borden house went really dark. Like, they got really angry and everything got really dark. And it could be mm -hmm. one of two reasons. Either because they didn't want people to know that there was some sort of a molestation thing happening or because they're upset that they were being accused of such a heinous act. But once again, they're not here to, re to represent themselves. So I feel like you need to listen to the story of what the energies have to say. I, I think with that, with, there, there's a difference to me when, when psychics can present like what their opinions of, this is what I'm picking up, this is what I'm getting. But if they're presenting like this happened and there is no evidence to it, there's no records of this happening, 
or any stories or anything, but they're presented this way. It unfortunately, I think it paints it, it paints people's minds of what they now expect. So when you have somebody coming and going, this is what happens, and there's no evidence to it. Now some people think, oh, this must have been happening for things, but there's nothing other than the psychic. Exactly. Uh, how do we back this up? Literally, there's nothing in the books about it. Uh, and I don't if, agree with that either. I don't agree with with accusing an energy of, of something like that, any sort of heinous act, unless the energy is the one that came through and said it through a spirit box or an EVP, you know? Well, I mean, like, unless the psych said, I think this might have happened, and then later on they found, like, evidence going, yep, it's according to these records or this journal or something, there's a possibility that there is truth to this, then there's something there. But if it's just simply one person's opinion of, I'm picking this up, that that's like, mm, we'll, we'll put it aside, but don't use that as absolute evidence. Well, it's dangerous, I think, for the energies involved. Because I think, like, with Lizzie Borden, what happened was everybody got, went and started doing seances, Ouija board sessions, accusing the father and the, the stepmom of, of rape or whatever. And then all of a sudden, all this dark stuff started happening in the Borden house. And now they're selling it again, which tells you they're, they're struggling with what they did to the energies mm -hmm. and it's just i don't know i just think like i know they're dead man if you're running a b and b or a location where you're making off making off with money from these energies respect the damn energies you know what i mean like they were human once too and i'm just i'm really disappointed to see across the board that that hasn't been the case and, and that includes bobby mackey's like i really think wanda got sick from uh, you know, Zach said, did you make a deal with the devil? Because she was allowing satanic groups to come in and do worship and do um, evocation and all that, you know, summoning. And she ended up getting sick with this really terrible cancer and she couldn't get rid of it and she passed away. And then before that, you had Carl, the former innkeeper, who also died at Bobby Mackey's from like weird health, mysterious causes. So once again, like, it, yeah, there's dark stuff here, but let's not make it darker like, I remember Wanda, like, because I knew her personally, she said, you know, Bobby Mackey's feels like there are energies in here that are going to war with other energies. So the gangster energies are at war with the demons, and then there's the prostitutes, and then there's the, uh, the energies that are part of the slaughterhouse, and they're all at war with each other because they've been summoned into this location. And it's just that... Is the money worth it? You know, like charging 800 bucks a night to let a ghost hunting group come in or, and just do whatever they want with the place? Uh, you know, and then you do pay the price, and now Wanda's gone, and it's sad. Yeah, and the problem I see with that is it's one of those where I don't, I don't mind if someone calls something up as long as you know how to clean it up and put it away. And I feel like that sounds more like events where people come in and they call up things, bring in things, but they don't necessarily know how to close the door or clean it up or basically clean up after their own mess I think. and that's I think when you're leaving all that residue and crap around that's when it's like you said the energies mix and it just gets nastier because you didn't clean up after yourself and you have a whole bunch of people coming in doing that and not being respectful or doing it properly well it properly is the word for it doing a seance is one thing but I, I would mm -hmm. never allow my crew to go into a location and summon in yeah. demonic activity, well, you know? And and there's some places I've seen that do not allow the use of Ouija boards. And even though it's like you can argue that with like EVPs, uh, with uh, voice recorders and just spirit communication, generally you can argue the two things. But I can understand why some places just put a no to Ouija boards. It's not, may not so much be the device itself. It's just the trouble that comes in with that because too often than not people who, who want to like bring out the weed board they might not necessarily know how to open and close it properly and right. they just don't want to clean up after that mm -hmm. i agree i agree and that but that can happen with all devices i don't i'm not afraid of ouija boards i think that fear is ridiculous mm -hmm. and i've talked about that before too but you're oh, right yeah, no, you have people that have done things the wrong way and incorrectly mm -hmm. Because once again, no matter what you're doing, communicating with the dead, it's necromancy. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't I mean, think, like, and I don't think people realize that either. Well, I 
I think when you're doing investigation, no matter what device, whether it's an old-fashioned dry mirror or a top-of-the-line electronic device, I think you should go in there, open like you're like opening like, hey, we're communicating, and then when you're done with the investigation, close down, say thank you, and, and properly close it like you would do with any communication, and that would probably lessen people's fear of uh, attachments or things wandering because you're you're making it very clear we're done now we're going home now i agree i agree 100 percent, 100 percent with that statement and it's hard mm -hmm. to find people that are on the same page when it's investigating and that's why it's so detrimental when you do go in a group of people to investigate that you go with people that you know and that you trust mm -hmm. because it can be unsafe and that's why i quit pilgrim was because there was an unsafe situation being presented and I believe in the other side. I believe in curses. I believe bad, bad things can happen. And I wasn't willing to put myself in harm's way. And so I agree 100% healthy, 100%. I can't believe we made it through the stream after all the crazy technology <laughs> things that we had going on. Like, wow, we made it. Um, Elfie, thank you so much for being here. Um, next week we have Kat. I don't even know what topic. I think I need to get on. I haven't done... I need to get on social media management. I'm having some issues. I've been busy this week. I haven't even hardly been home. I have more work to do. Um, but thank you, Elfie, so much for being here. I hope you have a lovely, lovely weekend, and we'll be chatting soon. And uh, I'm going to let Elfie go. Bye, Elfie. We'll see you later. So, um, yeah, Elfie, yeah, sorry about the connection issues earlier. That was strange. I still don't really know how that happened. But... Anyway, everything's been really great. We're just working a lot, prepping for, um, you know, another pilot, sort of working with um, finding another person, um, seeing how that's going to go, and it's just been a lot of work. I know that I was, I disappeared from social media this week, and you guys know when I'm gone from social media, something's going on behind the scenes, you know what I'm saying? I'm actually going to be going to the Haunted Museum tomorrow. I have some friends in town who are producers from Los Angeles who have not been to the Haunted Museum, so I'm actually going tomorrow. Um, so that should be fun. I'll let you guys know about all of the new exhibits. I'll, maybe um, Kat and I will sneak in a stream to just sort of chat and catch up on like Sunday or Monday, and I'll talk about uh, new exhibits at the museum. And uh, yeah, other than that, work. You know what I mean? I hope you guys had a lovely week. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Please make sure you give our video a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the, our channel if you haven't already. Make sure you're always following us for social media updates on social media. Um, and that's all I got. I'll let you guys know how the museum is tomorrow. We'll see you later, guys. Bye. Back, back, back from the dead. <laughs>